All right, folks, we are back on the Acer P Bonsai channel here with our candy kitchen uh, cultivar. And uh, we've finished the initial pruning. So now I wanted to take a closer look and discuss some of those initial choices we made. Um, we're gonna move in closer here in a second. Uh, so hopefully from there you can still see I've got cut paste all over the place. I wanted to highlight that, you know, there's a bunch of different cut paste varieties out there and they all work fairly well. Um, I prefer to use the Japanese variety here for my maples. I use the gray kind. So you'll find this, and this is a little bit sun bleached, but this started out with a green label and inside you can see that it's gray. Uh, now the other variety will have a brown paste and the brown paste has hormone in it that actually encourages additional healing. But on our maples, if you use the brown variety, it tends to cause a little bit of excessive scarring and bulging. Uh, and with our maples being so delicate and thin barked, we want to have a nice, slow, um, consistent healing process. Uh, so that's why I use this variety. All right, so we're going to move in a little bit closer on this tree so that we can talk about some of the features on the tree, some of the structural flaws on the tree, and then some of the decisions. I did make some of those decisions during that time lapse process, but I left a few so that they're still here for us to discuss. All right, let's get a little, let's All right, get now that there. we're a little bit closer, you should be able to see a little bit more of the detailed branching on this tree. And what I wanted to do is hold up one of the branches I cut off just to give you a closer look at the kind of material and the kind of growth we were dealing with. So here's the branch. And as you can see, I cut it back here, but the inner nodes were quite long. This is probably three inches, four inches, just really excessive growth. So this would have you know, gone off screen, but even if it was interior, you can see how far this projected from the tree. This is never ever gonna be usable for bonsai. And so we had to make all those initial cuts and that's, that's what leaves us here uh, to this structure. All right, so taking a look around the tree, you can see that I made some fairly decent sized cuts. And some of you may also be noticing that there's a little bit of bleeding and you'll see a lot of stuff online that says, hey, you can't cut your maples before spring because they'll bleed and it'll kill the tree. Now, although, it does weaken the tree to bleed. This is part of the natural maple physiology. And as I said in the previous video, this tree was field grown quite vigorously. Um, and so it has a lot of stored up energy and we are not gonna be at risk of depleting this tree of too much energy. Additionally, I'm making sure that it stays well watered and moist. So you do need to of course, make sure that your tree never dries out if it is bleeding, but this shouldn't be something to worry about in a really strong, healthy tree. So I'm gonna to try to move the tree around and give you guys a better look. You can see this here. This is one of the first things I wanna address is this branch that's going to the interior. Now, there is one very short node away from the trunk, but it does create a little bit of inverse taper here. And so it's not exactly ideal, but something I've learned over my last few years of bonsai is that even though you may have some small structural imperfections with your tree, it's not always the correct choice to just cut them off and go back to a perfect ideal tree. So we have one branch that kind of comes back into the center and it has actually a little bit of interesting movement. It curves and, and comes up here. So this may end up being used, it may not be used. And then over on this side, you have two that fork off together. And these, these two are kind of have an analogous movement to them. So they kind of could fit together well. I believe what I'm going to do eventually is cut off this larger branch and leave these two. Now this one might be seen as a structural flaw because it goes into the center of the design between these three trunks. But remember, we're looking for a more naturalistic looking tree. So some of these unusual twisting looking branches will actually add a little bit of character. Now this one here, although I just talked to you about the safety of cutting, even though there's a little bit of bleeding, this is a pretty big branch and I didn't want to take it off. So with this one, I'm either going to keep it on a little longer or at the earliest, I'm gonna to decide to cut this right after the first flush is hardened, and that should happen toward the end of May. So usually that end of May, beginning of June is the, is the time when you make these larger structural cuts. The other reason it's important to wait is because it's a really interesting junction here, and although I do see a collar pretty well formed around it, I'm worried that the girth here, since it's larger than these other two branches and about the same size as the segment below, it could cause dieback. Probably won't, but on this material, I don't want to risk it. So I'm going to leave this extending branch and I'm going to rotate the tree a little bit so you can see from another angle. So here you can see the junction 
it's got a small node here, and then it's got these two opposing branches. So these are probably going to be the branches I keep, and possibly sometime in the future, I may even end up taking this flawed branch off of the interior. But for now, I think it adds a little bit of body. We're going to see how it buds out in the spring. And then this larger branch coming this way is probably going to be removed in June or the end of May. Rotating back around slightly, you can see that this big branch is actually over the top of this lower branch here. And this branch did come out about another six to eight inches before I did the trimming. So I've trimmed this back to a nice, delicate primary and secondary structure. Even there's a little bit of tertiary here, depending on how you count your branching. But we're going to see how this one develops. And we may end up trimming some of these back after the summer. And then there's another nice branch. Again, right here, this is a great one to discuss because you can see this might be called a structural flaw. We really actually have these two, or this, we have this triplet of branches on this side. Again, we're gonna reduce the large one. And then directly opposite on the same node, we have these other two branches emerging. So probably most people would cut this entire knuckle off and then leave only one or the other of these two branches here. For me and for now, I'm going to leave actually these two small branches and I'm gonna leave both of these branches. There is a little bit of inverse taper happening here uh, because of so many branches emerging from one spot, but I think we still have some time to make a decision later on which branch is most optimal or possibly we'll keep a few of these branches because you can break the rules of bonsai. You can have a few violations of the one to two rule. And I think here, because of the branching that the tree has given us, it might be a good idea to keep both of these. More than likely, if I do decide to keep both of these two branches, I'm probably going to take off this thicker extension of that primary branch line and go to this smaller branch here. So this will probably come off all of that, leaving this smaller branch, which may end up getting cut back even to here and then see what kind of back budding we can get on this little branch. Again, this is also gonna probably require some wire to bend it over out of the way so it's not competing for light with this other branch. And now that we're on the topic of wire, uh, I'd like to discuss my approach for wiring Japanese maples. Japanese maples are a very thin bark tree and they're very delicate and they're easy to scar. So there's all kinds of different techniques on wiring. And the, the way we wire a Japanese maple, we need to take a special care to make sure that we're not damaging the bark because once you scar a Japanese maple, that's it, it's scarred for life. Okay, that might be a little bit of an exaggeration, but you're talking 10 to 20 years or possibly more to get a scar to heal. And that's with vigorous growth. So if we can all help it, we definitely want to avoid scarring any of our delicate branches on this tree. All right, folks. So we just got finished looking at this triplet coming off the interior of this trunk. And there's actually another example of something very similar. And that's actually up here on the primary or dominant trunk. And you can see this branching here. This is like you know, there's this branching down on this side, and then this is one of the larger branches coming off of that main trunk, and then it splits. You can see that the trunk or this branch here used to extend straight out along the original branch line, and that was cut back probably a few years ago. I cleaned it up a little bit and put some of the cut putty on there, but you can see we've got two branches going this way, and you've got another branch going this way. Now, although this structure is not perfect, I do really like the transition of taper going from here over to this branch, and it's already got some really interesting movement, as well as like a nice change in caliper as you go out the branch. Over on this side, although this is gonna create that big slingshot shape, I think our best option is probably to go with this branch here. Now this is still pretty strong. It's not got the best taper, and this node here is actually quite long as well. I'm gonna rotate it around so you can see. This node here is actually still pretty long, and there's a little bit of inverse taper at the end. So we may end up reducing it. Potentially, these two little branches here could end up being the new extension of this branch. So more than likely, this branch underneath that's coming off of this same side is also going to be reduced. I have thought about keeping it and maybe I could move some of these finer branches down to create their own space. And we could even do these two branches and then cut this back branch off. But again, same as the discussion with these lower branches that had imperfections as far as the one to two rule and potential for causing inverse taper, we're a little bit too early in the process to make the final decisions on what we're gonna do with this branch. In fact, we may end up cutting this branch all the way back to here 
there is a node line here and we could potentially get some budding down here. We may even just completely regrow this branch down into this lower space. These are crowding the upper branches a little bit. So it would actually be nice to have some more branches down in this space over here. So we'll address that in the future, but I wanted to draw your attention to it so you'll be looking for it in future videos. All right, let's spin the tree around. All right, over on this side of the tree, we've got a few things that I'd like to talk Here's about. Here's that upper branch that had the triple junction that we are gonna to have to address later. But I wanna focus your attention lower down on the trunk line. As you can see, this branch extends sharply upward and then slightly bends out. I've cleaned it up. I cleaned up a scar that was over here and cut it back and then pasted it. I also cut off the end because it was extending really far outside of the design. There is a small branch here that potentially could be used, but more than likely, in the end of May or June after the leaves harden, I'm probably going to prune this all the way back to here. You can see that we have a good collar formed here. There's actually one little kind of triangular shaped node. And so there's a really good opportunity for back budding down here. So I foresee a new branch and we'll have to build that completely from scratch somewhere down in here. And that'll help fill that space. Also, while we're here, let's take a look at these wounds that are scarring. So as you can see here at the base of this trunk, just a little bit above the graft, there's still this really big gnarly wound. And you can tell that this was part of the process of growing this tree out so vigorously. There was a huge branch that used to be here and must have been trimmed off a season or two ago. It's already starting to heal quite nicely, but it's kind of started to stagnate. So uh, after we get started, we're going to clean that up a little bit. We'll probably dig in there with a power tool and then we'll re-scar the edge of this and cover it with cut paste. There's a few other wounds on the tree like that. So there's this one here. The back branch has a really prominent wound here. It's healing really nicely. It's in a teardrop shape. So we'll do the same. We'll clean that up and we'll cover it with cut paste. On this trunk, you can hardly see it. Let me try to angle this tree a little bit, but there is another little scar here. It's almost completely healed, but we will still address that because we want to speed up the healing process. All right, now to just kind of generally talk about the tree. You can see it has kind of an interesting shape already. This primary trunk comes out this way and forward toward the viewer. Someone told me that a proper bonsai should be bowing toward the audience. It's a sign of respect. That's kind of an interesting idea. Another time I heard someone say that it's not that it's bowing, it's that the tree's leaning forward and that creates the perspective so that if you're a viewer looking up at a large tree from below, you're literally looking up and you can kind of see the underside of the canopy, particularly toward the front of the tree. So when we have a tree that's designed with this curve forward, that's actually a really great setup for creating a beautiful bonsai. I'm gonna turn this sideways so you can see this curve in the trunk line. Can you guys see that? There's a nice curve right there that gently slopes that way from base to tip. So that's a really nice feature for the bonsai. Now the secondary trunk has a really strong branch and it is in its own space here, but is somewhat strong comparative to the rest of the tree. So there's some big decisions to be made here. For now, I'm gonna leave this on the tree and see how it develops. We could potentially shorten this trunk back down all the way and just develop a nice small secondary apex using this line here. All right, then we've got this opposing trunk here and it's pretty strong. So this one we kind of call the dominant trunk. It's the tallest and is the highest on the design. This trunk here actually has a little bit more girth than that trunk though. So it competes in another way, but is a little bit more short and stout. It's kind of interesting. That moves up, we've got the, tr the branch here that we already talked about, and then it continues to flow up. And then I'm gonna move this forward to give a better angle. You can see that it has these really strong branches that split right here toward the very top. You can see the scar here that needs a little bit of work and I'll have to repaste this. That's where the growth was allowed to extend out so that you could thicken this branch. So for now, we have this really nice, pretty full branch structure. It seems a little bit oversized for so high in the apex of the tree, but I think right now it's important to maintain the strength of the tree. So we're not gonna cut any of this back. We're gonna let it grow. We're gonna see how it develops. We may even end up using this to grow out whips for thread grafts. And so that way we're not disturbing the progression of the rest of the design and we can still have our thread graft whips elsewhere on the tree without impeding our work on developing the rest of the tree. So I see this over here as the main progression of the trunk line for this third trunk. 
Now let's take a closer look up at the very tip of this trunk. You can actually see it's quite congested. Since we're looking at this variety here, which is a candy kitchen, we know that it's a witch's broom. And witch's brooms are typically smaller in leaf. They generally have a shortened center node to the leaf. And then they also have a lot more close branching, which is really great because it gives us more opportunity to select our branches for developing a nice little bonsai tree. But sometimes you'll notice that it almost goes too far. And at the very end of this branch, you can see that there's just node after node after node, and they're only about three or four millimeters apart. There's probably, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. There's like 10 nodes right here between my fingers. So although that's really great, you can see that it's more like a long, thick branch, and then there's all these little branches that are too close together. So at some point, we're going to have to make some more decisions here. We're probably going to end up cutting a lot of this back because we really want to start developing that ramification. We don't want to just have one long branch with branches off the sides. That's going to look like a young tree, not an old tree. So there's more work to be done. I already cut a lot in that initial pruning, so I'm just going to hold off for now, see how the branches develop in the spring, and then we'll make some future decisions. Let's do one more twist around up close. You can get a good view of the tree. All right, one other thing to think about, and I don't know if it's showing on camera, so I'm gonna lift this up a little bit. Um, the graft is not perfect, but it's really pretty good, and we can do some techniques to work on that in the future. And then also you'll see that the tree, all in all, if we go with the forward lean of that primary trunk, the base of the trunk is actually leaning away from the viewer. So to make the trunk level, it would actually need to be at an angle more like this. Now, we're going to try to correct for that when we go to do our repot, but we're not going to really be sure exactly what those roots look like until we get inside and have a chance to clear all of this old soil away. So I'm really excited to do that next step. So I'm sure you're probably wondering about my uniform. I'm actually still active duty. I'm at my last duty station on my way toward retirement here in a few years. And uh, I just wanted to, you know, share that the art of bonsai is this just amazing craft and even the community around it is just so supportive and it's been really really helpful for me getting past combat trauma and even just the the day-to-day -day stressors of military life i highly recommend it for any veteran if, if you're a veteran out there and you're uh, looking for something that will help center you or just give you something to do with your hands you know if you're if your mind is wandering on negative thoughts and you need something to get you back in the right space. I, I really recommend Bonsai. Uh, feel free to reach out to me directly on my Instagram or in the comments section. I'd love to chat uh, about how much it's helped me out. And I really just love it so much. And I, I want to be able to spread the joy of Bonsai, particularly Japanese maples. And uh, although there's a lot of reasons to love Japanese maples, for me, you know, some of the biggest reasons are the fact that it has so many changes. You have the winter silhouette, you have the spring color, you know, the, the leaf, leaves change in the summer and then you have autumn color again and the leaves falling. It's something interesting and exciting every season. And I, I have to be honest to say also, it really allows me to maybe tap into some o OCD tendencies that I have. So when we go to the spring pinching and you're coming out every check morning, your new buds that have opened that you can pinch back, it's just something really hands-on and really allows you to connect and relax. And so, I really just love it. I want to spread the art of bonsai as far as I can across America, particularly Japanese maples. They have so much elegance and beauty, and there's just something really special about them. I know a lot of bonsai practitioners at the higher level consider Japanese maples to be too easy, uh, but really I think there's something just so unique and beautiful and elegant about them. And there really is a lot of art that goes into crafting a high quality Japanese maple. A run of the mill, middle ground Japanese maple, sure, anybody can do that. But I hope you guys will journey along with me and, you know, teach me as well. So get into those comment sections and push back on me if I'm ever off, off topic or if I'm straying in the wrong direction. I, I'd love to learn and connect with the Bonsai community out there. And I hope that uh, this can be an inspiration to others, uh, starting with, uh, you know, fairly humble material. This tree here is maybe not super humble. You know, I did have to save up for this. Um, we'll just say it's somewhere in the $500 to $800 range. Um, but I have a couple other trees that I'm going to be working on. I have another one. It's a really cool tree and it was, you know, under $300 for that tree. Um, so there's going to be something more accessible and, and there for everybody. I know in my intro video, I said I wanted to have that kind of higher end starting material. 
But I really, you know, the truth is I love maple so much that I'm, I'm definitely going to go to, you know, the from seed trees that I've started uh, a few years ago. And, you know, even some of those nursery stock trees. I have a Oridona Nishiki I'm really excited to share. And I have the mother tree finally hacked down and air layered, I think six or seven times for it to be down to the size of bonsai. And I'm getting ready to plant that into a forest planting with all the air layers and rooted cuttings that I took off of it. So that's gonna be another really exciting project. And that tree was really accessible. It was, I think about $250 for this big six foot mother tree. You know, being able to produce a handful of air layers and several rooted cuttings, uh, the tree's really paid for itself. I could have sold off some of those and recoup my cost, uh, even with the trees I have remaining. Um, so I'm really excited about that option too. And uh, the ability to create just these beautiful compositions and the fact that there's so many different leaf characteristics and different bark characteristics and colors there really just is something for everybody in Japanese maple bonsai. So anyway, I, I probably rambled on enough. Thank you guys so much for joining me. Please like, subscribe, and comment. I really am looking forward to seeing your comments down below so that we can connect and discuss uh, what you've got going on uh, in your bonsai garden. Thanks and have a good day.